Man. Good evening. Let's see. Hold on just a minute. Got it. Great. Let's see. Is Fordham in the house? You guys have got to turn it up. You're embarrassing me, okay? I'm wearing my Fordham mask to represent. The least you can do is help me here, okay? Fordham Prep is making more noise than you, all right? All right. I hear their confessions. That's why I know. Seriously, I do. Good evening. I was getting a little worried when we had a song that was going on just before. And I thought, my God, they are so Catholic. They're so quiet. Now, I'm Catholic, obviously, but I'm the only Catholic, my immediate family are the only Catholics in my extended family. We have a lot of Baptist Pentecostal folks, and we're not afraid to make some noise. Because if you're going to work for justice, you're going to have to make some noise sometimes. Now that's better. And I really mean that. I mean, I'm so happy to be here. Someone asked me earlier, what gives you hope in the work for justice? And I look out and I see almost 1,500 examples of hope. You could be anywhere doing anything on a Saturday night. And yet you're here in Washington, D.C. And you're here because of your faith, because of your love for justice, because of a hunger that's deep within you that's burning. And you're not here just because it's a free weekend in Washington, D.C. You're here because there's a dream a yearning. And when I look at you, I see not the hope of the future, I see the hope of the present. Yes, you are the people who are the church. Church is not people who dress up like me. I mean, I'm glad to be part of it. But it's people like you who make the church live. You are the church, not in some future place. You are the church right now. Now you might be saying, why is he telling us all of this? Because he's building you up. Because now that you know you're the church and you're the hope, we need to have a very deep, serious conversation. We're going to talk about things that maybe your parents or those a generation older than you would rather not talk about. We're going to talk about race in our world and in our church and in our nation and how we can heal it and how we need to be reconcilers agents of justice and reconciliation, but to do that, it means we have to tell some really hard truths. Truths that most of us want to walk away from or not look at. And I know because when I talk to adults about this stuff, who was it that was talking about receive a lot of hate mail for your, for your advocacy? You must have been reading my inbox. Because when you do this kind of work, you're going to get hate-filled letters. But I think I know that because you're here, you are up to having a deep, serious conversation. And so we're going to talk about racial conversion and reconciliation, witnessing to an Ignatian value. 
not only Ignatian, Franciscans can have it, Dominicans can have it. We're talking about it as Ignatian folks. And what does it mean to be agents of reconciliation and conversion in a world that is broken and needs deep, deep healing? When we look at the sign of the times, Signs of the times is that phrase that comes from the Second Vatican Council that said that the church has the duty to scrutinize the signs of the times and to interpret them in light of the gospel. So what's going on? Now, we can't talk about everything, every broken issue that's present in our world. Don't come up to me later and say, you didn't mention this. Well, I can't mention everything in 30 minutes. They gave me a time limit. We're going to take the Star Trek warp speed overview of our world. Because everything you need to know in life you can find in either the Bible, Star Trek, or Harry Potter. So, (laughs) We've all been through a pandemic. We've heard the pandemic mentioned early, often. And you will hear other references through it throughout, throughout this weekend. We've all been affected by it impacted by it, but not all equally. There are those among us who have borne the brunt of our uncertainty, of our fear, and our anxiety, who have been scapegoated for uh, something that is a natural occurrence. COVID viruses happen. Viruses mutate. But fear can be manipulated and erupt in anger and intolerance. Yes, we've all been through a terrible pandemic. We were all vulnerable, but we're not all equally vulnerable. There have been those among us, especially the poor and persons of color, who have not been able to work remotely, who have not had access to health care who could not socially distance, and who bore the brunt of this disease and its impacts. We've heard these names over and over again. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and dot, 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 dot. Because these are only three of the many, many, many victims We could call out the names of Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland and Eric Gardner and Michael Brown, and we still would have more names to call. We realize that we live in a world where all of us are not treated equally and treated the same. And people erupted in protests, and it was beautiful to see. But those with their feelings and yearnings for justice were not universally shared. Even in our church, ministers of the gospel, priests dressed like me, had the nerve to say that those who were working for justice were maggots and parasites. But in most churches, what you heard were the sounds of silence. Because only 32% of white Catholics heard any homily that mentioned Black Lives Matter or mentioned any protest in the last year. Less than a third despite the fact that it was all over our TV sets. We'll come back to what's going on with that, too. Yes, we're gathered in our nation's capital. Our nation's capital, which was the scene of unprecedented violence. Never before in our nation's history had people come to this place to engage in acts of violence to overturn the results of a multiracial democratic election. And we live in a country where there are still efforts being made to overturn, to suppress, 
to disenfranchise millions of Americans, primarily poor, persons of color, young people. And there's a climate, crisis, climate um, conference going on in Glasgow right now. We hear about climate justice and a state of our world. But we also need to be aware of the fact that the poor and persons of color bear the brunt of our ecological irresponsibility. As we see in America, communities of color and poor communities can't even depend upon the basic right of having clean drinking water, drinking lead contaminated water Lead that poisons the body, that stunts the growth, that tears apart the mind. And many of these harms are irreparable and lifelong. And there are those among us who are members of the LGBTQ community. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community, I say to you, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> we don't always hear those words spoken in a Catholic context, but it's about time we change that. But even here, when we're talking about the welcome inclusion of LGBTQ persons, those who are members of this community who are also persons of color have a very differential life experience. Oftentimes not welcomed by their own ethnic communities of origin or even welcomed by the larger LGBTQ community. And if we go to our southern border, and we've heard it talked about tonight, but we don't always talk about the fact that many of those who are being turned away are LGBTQ youths from Honduras and El Salvador who are fleeing for their lives and are being turned away precisely because of who they love or how they express their gender identity. What you see in this Star Trek warp speed overview is that no matter what your particular social justice interest is, whether it's with the environment or LGBTQ realities or, or homelessness or mass incarceration, you cannot go far without dealing with the reality of race and racism because every major social justice challenge that we face is entangled with and aggravated by racial injustice and animus directed against persons of color. We cannot eliminate poverty if we don't deal with racism. We cannot have peace in our streets if we don't deal with racism. We can't have educational opportunity if we don't deal with racism. And here's we come to what we need to bring to the world. A witness of reconciliation. The Society of Jesus, and I, well, by the way, I'm not a Jesuit, so this is not, you know, a, a push that you can become Jesuits or anything like that. Don't ask me why I'm not one. I mean, that's, an, that's something I can tell you over some Diet Coke, maybe. Anyway. The Society of Jesus has a series of apostolic preferences to guide their work in the work of their sponsored ministries. And two of them are important for tonight. Walking with the excluded and giving young people a future full of hope. And if we are going to walk with the excluded, if we're going to give young people a future full of hope, 
then we must be agents of reconciliation, moving our world from crisis and conflict to healing and forgiveness. But in order to do that, we have to first undergo a deep conversion of our own. We need to undergo a racial conversion. But conversion is a word that can be so manipulated and tamed and domesticated. Oh, we've heard about conversion all of our lives. The root of conversion comes from a Greek word, metanoia. Now, you're going to learn something tonight. I'm a teacher. I have to teach you something, okay? So say metanoia. Metanoia. Metanoia is the Greek word that we translate as conversion, but its deeper meaning is a profound about face. It means you're going in the wrong direction, and you have to turn your life around. When Jesus called his disciples, those first folks that he saw on the seashore, and they were fishing and, you know, doing their thing, and Jesus calls them and says, come, follow me. It says they put their nets down. They left everything behind. They had a complete break with their past way of life to follow him. Metanoia is the call of the gospel. It means that God wants us to be more than we think we can be. We use the image of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly to symbolize what conversion is all about. You look at a little caterpillar and you say, how can that thing fly? God looks at each of us and says that we're all caterpillars in this work for racial justice, but God sees that we can be more. We can do more, but it means that we're going to have to die to the way we were in order to rise to what we can be. You see, resurrection is not a mere resuscitation. Resurrection is not breathe, coming back to the life you were before. Resurrection means you've died to what you were before so you can become something much more. And that's what we're called to do. But it means there's going to be some dying to an old way of life and an old way of thinking if we're going to rise the newness of life. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old order has passed away. Now all is new. I invite you now to take with me a journey to healing racial division. But know that there's going to be some dying. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Nervous laughter, that's okay. There's going to be some dying for us to rise. The cross is always so inconvenient for Christians. We like to wear this jewelry, but, you know, that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> oh, you heard that. Okay. When I think of the racial divide, we talked about chasms before. We are separated by chasms of understanding. The slide you see in the screens was an editorial cartoon in the Milwaukee newspaper in my hometown, Marquette University, and give you a shout out. I was there for 12 years. There was a shooting in Milwaukee of a, Milwaukee, of a white police officer it was the lead story in the news for over a week. The officer's funeral received front page news and the funeral was even live casted on TV. That same week, six other youths were killed in Milwaukee's central city and there was hardly any public notice. And so you see this editorial cartoon where you have white Milwaukee on one side saying, I said, isn't it a shame about the shooting? And black Milwaukee on the other side yelling, which one? 
But you see two people, two parties, separated by chasms of understand, misunderstanding, seeing the same events, living in the same place, but seeing them very differently. How do we begin to heal that kind of divide and chasm? That's the image. I want you to stay with me. The first thing we have to do is that we need to wake up and pay attention and become aware that there is a division, that there is a divide. And that's not as easy as it seems because there's so much in our world that kind of tells us that the way things are is normal. It's just the way it's always been. It's the way things are. You can't change them. Or we even have other explanations. Well, you know, if so many black men are getting killed because they're not obeying the police, if they'd just be more obedient and law-abiding, there wouldn't be a problem. Not looking at the fact there are a whole lot of white folks who aren't very law-obedient and abiding. They're still walking around. We also don't look at the fact that poor Tamir Rice, a young boy sitting in a park in a swing, is killed within two seconds of an officer's arrival. We wake up when we have experiences that raise questions that society's answers can't satisfy. And we have that nagging feeling that something's wrong. Then we begin to wake up and we pay attention. Now, what do we do after we wake up and pay attention, become aware of what's going on? Oh, we want to leap in and fix the problem. We want to solve it. Let's get a meeting. Let's get a five-year plan. No. The thing we need to do next is to sit in the discomfort of that realization. We need to lament. We need to mourn. We need to grieve the brokenness of our world. And by lamenting and grieving the brokenness of the world, I don't mean having some kind of antiseptic prayer service. I mean really cry about what's going on. Because until we grieve and we mourn, and we're upset about what's going on, then we won't do the difficult work that it's going to take to change it. Sometimes I teach, I teach courses at um, on racial justice at Fordham. This is a wonderful course called Martin Malcolm Baldwin in the Church. I love it. There comes a point in the semester when my overwhelmingly white students have what I call the OMG moment. Oh my God. I had no idea it was this bad. Then it's followed closely by another moment this sucks. Or they use some other expletives that I can't say right now because it's being recorded. <laughs> and I don't bother to correct their language because until we get angry enough and grieve enough and get to the point of saying we can't let this go on any longer unless we have that kind of emotional, visceral reaction, then we cannot be genuine agents because the work will be too hard and we'll make too many excuses and we'll say it can't be done. But here's another thing I want to remind you of. I don't want you to grieve only because people who look like me have it bad in the world. No, I want you to grieve because... You know, white folks pay a price for racism, too. But they're not always aware of it. Let me give you an example. 
Georgetown University and the Society of Jesus are beginning to have, they're in the midst of their own reckoning with the fact that they owned 272 enslaved women and men. And contrary to the Vatican's instructions, they sold these 272 in order to deal with their own financial misfortunes, splitting up families, making it impossible for them to practice the religion that they baptized them into. They recently had a service of reconciliation and mourning at Georgetown. Father Timothy Kaseki, who's going to be the celebrant of this year's Mass here at, at the, at the Teachem, as the president of the, of, the, of, the, of the American Jesuits, he stood up before the community of the, of the enslaved descendants and he said, when we remember that together with those 272 souls, we received the same sacraments, read the same scriptures, said the same prayers, sang the same hymns, and praised the same God, how did we, the Society of Jesus, fail to see us all as one body in Christ? We betrayed the very name of Jesus for whom our least society is named. And this is what I want those who are white in this room to understand is that one of the major prices you pay for racism in America is the betrayal of your own values. When you've been around friends who have said some stupid stuff and you've said nothing. Or you've been around family members who have said some awful things and you've said nothing. You need to grieve the betrayal. You need to grieve the fact of your own moral, ethical death. Because until you grieve that, you won't have the courage to do the difficult work that's coming. So after you've waken up and you realize there's a gap, a chasm, and after you've grieved and you've mourned and you've said, this cannot be, what then do we need to do? We need to build a bridge across the chasm. Unless we understand how we get to where we are, we can't change it. That's why I'm very disturbed by efforts around this country to say, oh, no, we're not going to talk about what happened in the past. We're not going to teach anything like that. We're going to call it critical race theory. They don't understand what they're even talking about. But it means that they don't want to learn truths that are going to make people uncomfortable. But unless we do, we cannot be genuine agents of change and transformation. White privilege doesn't mean that white people have always had it easy. Absolutely not. There are a lot of white folks who are struggling in this world. But what it does mean is that at least your skin color isn't something that you have to struggle against. That's what we need to change. <laughs> After that, then, genuine solidarity with people of color being an ally, and part of that is listening, listening, hearing the stories that may make you uncomfortable, but realizing that those stories are important to hear because it's part of what living in the real world is all about, and then acting for justice and social transformation. And here that means using your privilege to challenge privilege. What do I mean by that? I often tell my white students that they're going to see and hear more naked racism than I will. Because when I'm in the room, 95% of the time, everyone knows how to behave. But what happens when I'm not in the room? Are you willing to use your privilege to challenge privilege? And I don't mean you have to give your friends a dissertation about white supremacy 
What I mean is simply saying when someone says something stupid, say, instead of laughing, saying, hey, bro, uh, duh, that's not funny. Or even daring to say to mom and dad, uh, mom, dad, uh, you may want to rethink that. Say it gently so you don't look your lungs cut off, but you'll say it. Because when white people say there's a racial issue present, people hear it differently than when I say it. When I say it, everyone says, oh, you're just playing the race card. But when white folks say it, people take it seriously. So use your privilege to challenge privilege. What I'm calling for us to do is to go to confession. We're Catholics. So sometimes we go to confession. Sometimes. It's been a while. Pope Francis, in his document for Telly Tutti, says we need to have an examination of conscience, honest truth telling naming how we've sinned by what we've done and by what we've failed to do. We need to have genuine contrition, that lament, that mourning, that grieving. We then need to have a public acknowledgement of responsibility and complicity because giving voice to that is what's part of the healing process. And then we enter into acts of penance that repair the damage and deal with the harm and cure the harm that's been done. And then we can finally end, as the right does, in a proclamation of praise and have a new beginning. I'm almost done, but I want to end on two notes. I want to talk about what it means to be pro-life. I want to talk about what it means to be pro-life and what the church really teaches. Because I'm really concerned that in many parts of our church, we've reduced pro-life to merely being anti-abortion. And that is not what the church teaches. And I've got the receipts. Pope John Paul II, in his last pastoral visit to the United States in 1999, he gave a stirring homily in St. Louis when he called upon American Catholics to be what he called unconditionally pro-life. And that meant standing against euthanasia, the death penalty, and racism. He said as part of being pro-life, he said the challenge facing this country is to eradicate every form of racism, a plague which is one of the most persistent and destructive evils of the nation. Pro-life has never meant a concern for only one issue. Now, Pope Francis continues the, continues the litany. Last summer, after the murder of George Floyd, he publicly prayed for George Floyd during his, during his public Wednesday audience, and he concluded by saying, we cannot turn, tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form, and yet claim to be defending the sacredness of every human life. Racism is a life issue. And if you still haven't gotten the point, he reemphasizes it in another apostolic exhortation where he says, our defense of the innocent unborn needs to be clear, firm, and passionate, but equally sacred are the lives of the poor and those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, the underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm, and the elderly, and victims of human trafficking and every form of rejection. Pro-life has never meant only being anti-abortion. That is not the teaching of the Catholic Church. And isn't it this crazy Fordham priest saying this? This is a saint, Pope John Paul II, and the current vicar in Rome, Pope Francis. And so, let's talk about being pro-life. I love unborn lives, especially black unborn lives. But I love them too much to stop caring for them once they are born. I want 
unborn black children to live in a world where they can eat nutritious food, breathe fresh air, drink clean water, where they can breathe and not have their breath crushed from them, where they can live without fear, where they can go sit in a park, go jogging, sleep in their homes and not be killed and not be blamed for their deaths. That's being unconditionally pro-life. And that is the call of the church. And that's why we are called to be witnesses of racial reconciliation and justice and healing, not because it's politically correct, not because it's a democratic platform, not because Republicans don't like it. We're here to do this because we are Catholic, we are Christian, we are followers of Jesus, we are children of God, and we believe in the dignity of life. That's why we do what we do. Oh, this is hard work. It's hard work. And we're gonna, you know what? Sometimes you work at this and you feel like you're not doing anything. You don't have anything that you can show for it. What gives me hope is I use the image of a relay race. In a relay race, you may, may not be the one who breaks the tape at the end. You're called to run your leg of the race to do your work as well as you can so that those who come after you can do the work that they can do. We call it in the Catholic world, part of being part of the communion of saints. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. What keeps me going in the cause for justice? People like you. I do the work I do for you so that you can do your work. And when I feel like, you know, who needs this kind of crap, I really think that if I put my baton down, I can't pass it on to you. And if I can't pass it on to you, you can't pass it on to those who come after you. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who perfects our faith and we press on running this race lured by the promise of majus the more for the greater glory of God we do this because of joy this isn't all just hard work there's a lot of joy to be present in this, doing this work Jesus says, I tell you all this so that my joy may be yours and your joy may be complete. And my prayer for you as you do this work, yes, it's hard. Yes, it ain't. sometimes you're going to be beaten down and you're going to get all kinds of crazy messages, but there's joy. And you know why I know it? Because there's joy in this room. I can't see your smiles, but I can see your eyes and your eyes are smiling and they're beaming because when you do the work of justice and you do the work of Jesus, there is joy. And that is my hope and prayer for you. I end with the words of a young person who captivated the nation on January 20th, Amanda Gorman, a young black Catholic woman who stood before the nation and gave us words of hope and challenge. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. In every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade aflame and unafraid. 
the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. Let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you.